Hello, my name is Honor Delorme, and this video is about the option of the Neurofeedback Pack software. So in this video, I'm going to go through some of the options and what you can do with the software. So here I've opened the uh, NFP Lab option. And then the first option which we saw in the live video was live demo was the an option about running in slave mode so you can connect through TCP IP and we'll see the TCP IP parameters a little bit below. Then we have, um, this is just to determine the path. This is, this is an option to stream a file that you might have recorded so in particular a GLAB data set. So you can stream it as if you were uh, recording data. And that's useful for debugging purpose because when you want to debug, sometimes it's hard to plug in a headset, etc. This way you can just stream a file and see what happens. It's also useful to really understand the mechanism of the software because you can put breakpoints, etc. It doesn't need to stream the data all the time. And uh, here it's set to empty by default, uh, but you can set it to the default here, which is a data file that's included with uh, uh, the software, Neurofeedback Lab. Then you have the type of stream and the name of the stream. So that's useful for LSL. So here the type is set to EEG and the name of the stream is set to empty. So it's going to find any stream that's of the type EEG. And usually most EEG systems have a stream uh, deliver a stream of type EEG so it's going to connect usually whatever headset you have but sometimes you might have to go and fix that uh, for example the name of your stream might be something specific you might want to enter that you can find the name of the stream that's all indicated in the readme files using the lab recorder which is a python program and this one shows you all the stream which are in your computer and then you can find the name of the stream. So that's the easiest way. Then the pause in second, um, the pause in second is uh, in between each loop. When you don't run in, in slave mode, how, how long do you wait before you go back to get some more data? And you can put zero, but then the feedback would be too fast and might saturate the computer. So it's usually good to put about 0.2 second of weight. And under your circumstances, it should use about 10% of your resources. Then you have the baseline duration and the session uh, duration. So the baseline is, as you saw in the other video, it's, it's a period where you do nothing and you're usually not moving and that's to calibrate uh, in particular the artifact sub subspace reconstruction algorithm but also the dynamic range of different frequency bands so uh, but you don't have to do that if you don't use our uh, ASR artifact with subspace reconstruction you don't need to use the baseline correction and then you have session duration so that's just a regular uh, trial after you acquired the baseline and you can change these here these are very interesting parameter right here. These are uh, some spatial filter. And uh, so for instance, here I have four channels with the Muse. So I use four channels. Uh, we also run this program with uh, Biosemi 64 channels, which is a research, research grade system. So then you put channel one to 64. You can compute average reference if you want. And then you can also uh, put a channel mask. And the channel mass can be very complex. Here it's super simple, it's just the activity of channel one. But uh, it can be, so it's a vector. It's, uh, here it's just the activity of channel one. So it's gonna extract the channel one. Uh, but it can also be, it uh, doesn't have to be one and zero. So it can be a re reference a channel. So you wanna do channel one minus channel three. So you put one and minus one. And then you can also have many different rows so you can create many different derivations. And then using this channel mask, you can also apply ICA, decomposition in real time, just applying the transformation. Of course, this makes more sense when you have more channels. But that's a very useful feature here, this channel mask. And you can even do many ICA decomposition, one per row. Then we have, uh, then we have uh, some hardware parameters here. So the sampling rate of the hardware, you can resample in real time when it's too high. For instance, with BiosMI, we had 2000 Hertz. So we wanted to resample in real time. 
most often that's not the case. Then the window size, you want, for instance, one second window to compute the spectral decomposition. The size of the FFT, window increment, in this case, it's 0.3 seconds. So it's 75 samples. You, you move by 75 samples. And uh, there is also an option here, one S rate is, uh, this is the theoretical values for the hardware sampling rate, but based on the number of value received per second, it can also calculate the actual sampling rate and then it can give you warning messages. Then you have two options to filter. You have just a regular filter. And so uh, then you put this one to true or you have ASR artifacts of place reconstruction and you can put this one to true. Then these are the feedback parameters. So the frequency range, here we just have one value, uh, so it's in theta, in the theta frequency range, that's between 3.5 and 6.5 hertz. We can have many of these, we can have 10 of these, so we're going to extract theta, we're going to extract alpha, we're going to extract beta, we're going to extract gamma, etc. And uh, then whether we want to convert the spectral power to uh, dB, or whether we want to keep the spectral power as is, Usually it's good to convert to dB because dB it's more it's more Gaussian. Um, then what do you want to do with the uh, spectral power? So here X is the spectral power and then we just have identity. So we just take the spectral power. But for instance, if we had uh, the we we had two frequency range, we had theta and alpha. We could do theta over alpha, so it would be X two divided. Uh, x1 divided by x2 or any combination uh, you might want and you can see here this is called theta channel 1 we can actually have as many here I can copy and paste we can have as many as we want so we can compute many different uh, many different things at the same time if we wanted to uh, the last one on the list is the one that's going to be used for feedback and uh, this is another parameter to cap the change from one block to the next. What's the maximum change? You don't want change to be too sharp. And then you have two types of feedback. You have a type that's called dynamic range, and then you have a type that's called threshold. Here the default is set to dynamic range. In the threshold mode, uh, basically if it's above a specific spectral power, it returns one. If it's below a specific spectral power, it returns zero. And then, so the threshold here, that's the threshold in dB, if you set the dB to true. And then you have the threshold memory. So the threshold is gonna change based on uh, the uh, current values. So it can evolve through time. And then you have two types of thresholds. You have the mode go and the mode stop. And basically, uh, go is going to give you one when you're above the threshold, zero be when you're below the threshold, and stop will be zero when you're above the threshold, and one when you're below the threshold. Then we have dynamic range here. So this one doesn't return zero and one, it returns a value between uh, zero and one. And the way it does that is that it's going to find the maximum range, the range, for instance, here in this case of your theta value, so let's say it's between 16 and 29, and it finds the position in this range. So it does linear interpolation. For instance, if you're at 29, you're at one. If you're at 16, you're at zero. And then it also adjusts the dynamic range. And so if you're outside the dynamic range, there's a dynamic range increment. It's gonna increase the dynamic range. For instance, if you're at 31 for the current value, it's gonna increase the dynamic range, the upper one by 0.33% uh, at uh, each iteration, as long as you're outside the dynamic range. And then you have the dynamic range shrinking, which is automatic. If you're in the dynamic range, it just shrinks automatically the dynamic range. And this allows you to, uh, so the subject is always within the dynamic range, dynamic range changes. But of course, if the subject is performing very well through time, they're gonna start performing worse because the dynamic range has changed. So you don't want the dynamic range to change too fast. Then we have options for feedback. So the cycle, so this was in the demo, cycle toolbox, uh, true or false, if you want to use the visual feedback from the cycle toolbox. We, we have the simple plot, and I demonstrated that as well. That's the default. We have an ADR board. This is to send TTL pulse 
through uh, a serial port and the serial port here is using a DR board so you would need to get the ADR board to uh, to actually do the feedback. I'll put the link in the description. Then you have the TCP IP. So here it's set to false. When it's set to true and you set it to slave mode, as we saw at the very top right here, uh, then it's waiting for a connection on a port. You can choose whichever port you want. And then it's behaving as, as a slave. So it's waiting for commands. And all the commands were uh, formatted as JSON files. And so it receives the JSON command. And basically, these are the variables. So you can change absolutely almost everything here. Uh, you can even change the name of the LSL type, the, the name of the, uh, uh, the number of seconds, the baseline duration, etc. So through the TCP AIP connection, if you set these variables, you can change the process. You can end more more process. You just uh, use a JSON command that's, uh, that will change these, these variables. So even when it's running in slave mode, you can change that. And then you can issue uh, free commands, which I'll show in a second. So these were well, there's additional command here for the file name for ASR and the file name, the output file name. It basically saves the raw data along with all the spectral power uh, calculated values etc there's also another function that's called your feedback line run and your feedback line run allows you to uh, run uh, the baseline and then different trials etc i'm not going to describe that function it's more peripheral but it allows you to set up a system where you would do double blind studies so uh, it would use the file from one person to do the feedback for another person. This way they don't know if they get the real feedback or not, etc. But that's 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 the this one is was done for research purposes. You probably won't need to use this one. Uh, and then these are other options here. When you set the filter, it's gonna change the filter, etc. So let's just look real quick at the commands you can send through TCP IP. We already know the options. So in the options in the JSON option file. Uh, if, if you put an, uh, one of these value, it's going to change the value in real time. And uh, what else can you change? Well, you can change, you can send commands. And commands would be uh, here, for example, when it's running in offline mode, it's, it's, it's actually the same as it when running through TCP IP. So it sends itself commands. So for instance, here we have LSR Connect connect to LSL, then start with run mode trials and you have run mode baseline, etc. then stop and then quit. So there's really only four commands, connect, disconnect, start, stop and quit. And all the rest are uh, options. And uh, that's basically the gist of it. That's basically how you can set all the options to uh, achieve uh, the desired uh, outcome.